Hey, what's up? My name is Cade, and today I'm doing this really fun collab with my buddy, Jesse. Go ahead and introduce yourself. Hi, I'm Jesse Diamond. Uh, I'm also a trans man. I had two bottom surgeries uh, last year and this year. Uh, I do like powerlifting and bodybuilding stuff, uh, make OnlyFans content, whatever. I went ahead and asked in my community tab a few days ago what questions you had for both of us. So let's get right to those questions. Bodhi Sassras uh, asked um, what my favorite uh, muscle group to train was and where I started seeing progress at the start of my transitioning uh, with working out. My favorite muscle group to train is chest. I really like barbell bench press. Um, I'm getting into a quick powerlifting and I'm just going to try to compete in just the bench press. Uh, just like the way it feels. I got into that because, you know, chest dysphoria, wanting to, you know, make my chest look different after top surgery, even though I liked my top surgery result and wasn't totally comfortable, wanted to change more. Uh, where did I start to see most progress? When I started my transition, I dropped, I think like 20 pounds the first two months on T. Really? Um, I was biking a lot and I just like gotten certified in training. So I was like doing group fitness classes and okay. biking everywhere and my metabolism was like, ooh, fast. I mean, my deadlifts got better. I guess mm. that, that, that during the start of my transition, that's only yeah. like other progress that I made. And your chest honestly looks amazing. Like I really respect it. It looks different than when I had surgery because it was like really concave. I, it was a lot of excess skin because I lost a uh, I lost 100 pounds in three months when I was 19, so wow. the skin came down to like here, so mm. like I could do like this. Mm. Pretty deflated looking, like the skin was uh -huh. attached to the muscle and it's like concave, so it was, I obsessively started hitting chest after mm. top surgery because of chest dysphoria. So like chest dysphoria can happen, you know, even after top surgery. Absolutely. I totally agree. Actually, I totally made a video about this over a year ago. If you want to check that out above, you can, but... I understand what that means. Even after I started to work out, like weirdly enough, cause after I had top surgery, it was completely flat. Like and beforehand I had like a pretty large chest. Like I wanted to get that off as soon as possible. But once I started to build muscle, weirdly enough, and I, you know, it got out more cause the pecs, when I sometimes would like lean over or have certain things like that, it actually brought me dysphoria, brought me back to that place of like the skin touching skin. Mm -hmm. So it's just weird like how different triggers like happen and bring back to certain time periods. Mm -hmm. I gained weight after phalloplasty, I gained like 10 or 15 pounds. Mm -hmm. I gained a lot of like water weight and like fatty breast tissue. So mm -hmm. like that made me feel really dysphoric because it, yeah. even though I already had top surgery, uh, they were very boob-esque. So yeah. they were sensitive. Like I was on my period. So yeah. Was, oh, well, this is familiar in a not fun way. So Matthias um, asked about phalloplasty. Um, so recovery. Ugh. <laughs> <laughs> I was back at work eight weeks, nine weeks maybe. Uh, I was still like in my um, my penis diaper, my, wow. my penis cloud. Really? It was, still, it was still at 90 degrees. Like I had a boner at work, <laughs> which I don't recommend. Uh, so I wore my fanny pack like to the side of it and like I had a sweatshirt and I would wrap that around. So like I would have like the little arms of the sweatshirt. So I had all these <laughs> things that would like kind of blend in and disguise the fact that like there's like a, a bulge. So yeah, I was back at work maybe like eight or nine weeks. I did not fully recover, like get my testosterone levels back, like back at the gym not feeling like shit till like after my second surgery, like maybe a month or two after is when I started to really have an upswing. Mm -hmm. So that was that uh, like seven months, six, seven months before I started to really fully recover. I, I had other stuff going on, um, but yeah, six, seven months isn't too bad. So I'm not complaining either. And I mean, how are you feeling now with like in recovery? I, I'm just glad that I don't have any sur surgeries on the horizon now. Not that I'm not thinking about like the final one, but mm -hmm. It's not, not ready yet, not mm -hmm. financially ready yet, mm -hmm. insurance-wise not ready yet. So yeah. taking my time with it, I feel good and I'm glad to make, I can walk again and my hormones aren't completely out of whack. Don Diddly Do asked us, 
Are there any surgeons or doctors you would recommend for transition surgery? If so, who? So I'm guessing um, they're asking about like either top surgery, bottom surgery, things like that. My experience personally, I have only had a double mastectomy. If you are in Utah or honestly anywhere around that area, Corey Agarwal is an amazing top surgery. She is extremely respectful. She is a perfectionist, which is a really good thing, I think, because this is gonna be your chest, you know, for the rest of your life. I would highly encourage you to check her out. I will link, like, her information in the bio. Every single person that I have seen her get, like, do top surgery for, I think the results look amazing. Yeah, your chest looks amazing. Oh, thank you. Congrats to you yeah. and her. My top surgeon uh, is Dr. Naveen Singh. Uh, he works at Washington uh, Plastic Surgery. Uh, so he has offices in Northern Virginia and in Maryland. He had his work cut out for him with uh, what I had going on. Um, and I think mm. he did a great job. Mm. And he knew how my chest would look best in the long run. Because uh, mm. I'm really happy now with the way it looks like. Mm -hmm. So I had a hysterectomy. And I'll be honest, I can't remember her name. If I can, I will put in the comments her name. Uh, I remember she's in Maryland and she's a very serious Russian and she <laughs> fought with my insurance company for coverage, so I should probably remember her name. That's awesome. Uh, and then uh, Jens Burley was my doctor uh, for phalloplasty phase one and two at OHSU in Portland, Oregon. Um, he does accepts some insurances, so he accepts the Oregon uh, State Insurance, Oregon Health Plan. I know that he accepts, I think, most Kaiser plans. I think he accepts some Blue Cross Blue Shield, but don't quote me on that. Yeah, definitely. Uh, but yeah, no, he, he makes a, a very pretty penis. I call him <laughs> the genie weenie. He's seen a lot of his, his work, and he, he does really great work. So that's why I trust him with my body. Mm -hmm. He's who I will go to. Well, it's a surgeon on his team who specializes mm -hmm. in the implants. Uh, and she's like a maverick from what I've been told and from what I've seen. Mm -hmm. um, she and Dr. Burley's team will perform my final surgery if and when that happens. So Zebra asked a few questions, but here are one of my favorites. What's your advice to people who want to conquer their dysphoria um, in sexual things, whether it is solo or with a partner? So what's your experience like? I feel like it's really important to, as a, as a trans person, to masturbate. I've been preaching that for almost a year now because I've like come like, like a full turn in appreciation for it. Like I've always appreciated the, you know, masturbation but like mm -hmm. now I see it's you know benefits in society and mm -hmm. within you know within our community specifically because if you can make yourself feel good it will help you feel more comfortable and confident when you are with another person or other people mm -hmm. I don't know how many people you play with at a time yeah you know helping them learn how to navigate your body but more in tune you are with um, what you got uh, you know, more comfortable and more sexy and less you're gonna struggle with dysphoria uh, when you are with other people. So, definitely masturbate. As long as it doesn't get in the way of your daily life of the things that you need to do, <laughs> you can masturbate every day. I mean, yeah. Most guys I know do. Most guys I know masturbate more than once a day. And like you were saying about getting to know yourself very well and see what feels good to you, I think dysphoria can be triggered very easily, especially if you have a lot more bottom dysphoria. So being able to like understand what feels good and being able to actually communicate that to your partner. Top tip for me about like sexual experiences with a partner is like being able to be completely honest and communicate, but not like, oh, afterwards, uh, like that was all right. Right. It's gonna be awkward, but actually talking about what's going on, what feels good, and what, like, a way that you can communicate that makes it, like, still, like, sexy as possible, I think is the best, like, key to have an amazing sexual experience with yourself and other partners or partner. Always communicate. Uh, you can't really be over communicative, especially if you're checking in with the other person about how they're feeling, or if you're mm -hmm. letting them know how you're feeling. If someone has a problem with that, then, you know, just remind them that it's a part of, you know, healthy, consensual, and, you know, good sex. Absolutely. Because uh, if you can actually explain something's feeling good, oh, 
you're just gonna have so much a better time. Um, when it comes to solo play, my biggest recommendations is if you have bottom dysphoria and actually like touching your growth gives you like a bad time, I seriously consider you looking into different like strokers and sleeves made for trans mask people because whenever I have more dysphoria and I don't wanna actually be like touching my dick but still have a fun time um, just using a stroker like I've reviewed a bunch of them you can check a playlist out here I seriously consider you check it out so zebra asked us how much did top surgery end up costing us um, so for me personally luckily my insurance was able to cover most of it I also had to like fight for it because it was like a month before I was gonna get top surgery and my insurance started to be like oh are you sure you need this? And I'm like, yeah, I'm fucking sure I need this. And it only ended up costing like a little under $2,000. And I was able to luckily get that paid off in like a year and a half. So I'm super grateful. That's how much it ended up costing for me. How about you? Uh, I did not get any insurance coverage. Uh, so I paid the full 6,000 for mm. mine. Mm. Um, and yeah, the story was bad enough and I think I needed at that point in my life to like kind of go through in the next steps of my transition in life. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Did you have fears and thoughts around top surgery before you got it done? Uh, yes, because I was a smoker. I smoked mm -hmm. cigarettes, which I don't recommend. I had heard rumors that your nipples could fall off. Uh, so that's like a nightmare. Mm -hmm. I mean... Nipples aren't everything. It's okay if you don't have nipples. It's okay if you have, you know, nipples you don't like. You know, we all got nipples, or we don't have nipples. Yeah. Most people are born with nipples. Yeah. Not everyone though. Um, but yeah, I just didn't want them to fall off. Anything falling, any part of my body, body falling off, like that kind of freaks me out. I was yeah. afraid about my dick falling off with the uh, phalloplasty. Uh, yeah. Because you have to do. A, a, bunch of extravagant shit to keep the blood circulating mm -hmm. and keep the penis alive. Mm -hmm. I was afraid that like it would die and I would have like a dead dick mm -hmm. hanging off my body until it like fell off. So like I had fears about that too. Mm -hmm. But when did you actually feel like secure that it was gonna be fully attached to your body? You're like, cause for me, for my nips, honestly it was like maybe three months when I was like, okay are here to stay <laughs> i i i came in with confidence because like i stopped smoking cigarettes for like six weeks before mm. surgery and then like the six weeks after and then i was like okay i'm picking this back up i guess i felt confident that i was like if they haven't fallen off now they're not gonna fall off mm. don't smoke kids same with your peen once i was out of the the diaper for sure yeah um, but towards the end of um the diaper phase which was i was in the diaper for like two months the penis cloud i had to get used to the fact that the temperature uh, in my dick is not the same as like the rest of my body oh, yeah? so sometimes my dick will be cold and sometimes my dick will be hot but the other parts of my body are not not reflective of that oh so yeah that that was like what it's fine it's normal my dick can also float i found that out recently in the bathtub I mean, you know what that means. It's so. fat. <laughs> so, uh, JJ Mc McCaskill, got that right? Okay, sorry JJ. JJ asks if there are any complications with my procedures. Uh, so with phase one of fallow, at a certain point I had a really bad UTI and it felt like, it felt like really bad period pains. It felt like endometriosis. It felt like mm -hmm. someone was stabbing my ovaries. Like, I couldn't. Wasn't supposed to be standing up, but I, I couldn't stand up. It was it was hardly like, getting me in the emergency room than doing all that. But then I found out like, oh yeah, it's a UTI. Take these antibiotics. It's like okay, that's all I needed. I felt yeah. like I was dying. My testosterone crashed after both my top top surgery and my phase one of bottom surgery. Mm -hmm. uh, so getting my hormones back to normal that took many many months, a long time. Mm -hmm. Consider that. Those complications, because like, yeah. those aren't. Mine was like longer than expected. Like, it mm -hmm. should only be like a couple months, a few months, and mine took like six, eight, nine months. So, yeah. Like, I'm a sensitive boy. There's nothing wrong with being a sensitive boy. <laughs> they also asked me, like, if I'm also considering bottom surgery. As of right now, um, I still have been kind of going back and forth, but 
I am like almost 100% sure I want to get a simple release, which is like basically the first stage to medioplasty. For me, I just want to get the like the simple release. So instead of like everything being attached to your body and being more down, it's actually able to you know, go up. Hopefully that will help me like relieve my bottom dysphoria enough. Eventually, I mean, in the next five years, that would be amazing, but we'll see. We'll see. <laughs> so Beatrice asked how the process of getting back into fitness after the surgeries was. At first with top surgery, I was fine. And then my hormones crashed after a couple months post-op. Um, but at first it was fine. Fallow, the first phase, uh, Basically, no. Like, mm. I got in the gym eventually. It, mm. I was in so much pain because mm. my body was a wreck. There's a lot of adjustments needed. Mm -hmm. um, after the second phase of phalloplasty, I only, they only basically like, took a little skin flap and made the head, mm. just made the head on the shaft. That's all they did. Mm -hmm. And it was, it was an outpatient procedure. I was out of the hospital that day. And oh, wow. I was back at work within like two or three days. Well, very little anesthesia very little downtime mm -hmm. and I was back in the gym and going at it and yeah so the, pretty much no recovery time for me um, for the second phase of alplasty and same thing with hysterectomy because um, she did a different type of laparoscopic hysterectomy where it was like I have like no scars from it uh, instead of having like three like entrance points because uh, a lot of people they have to like make three insertions yeah she did, two but you can't see like one's in the belly button and then one's like then leave a scar um so i was back in the gym in, like that week well i'm really glad that you have been able to like get back into like fitness even if it was a longer process for the stage one because obviously you know fitness is important to you so Ugh. i like it i think it can be helpful like if you can find a way to feel a movement, like you can enjoy your body in a movement way, then I really consider you like looking into it because fitness in any type of way can be helpful, I think. Releasing endorphins makes you feel better. Uh, so that'll help with dysphoria, depression, uh, anxiety, all yeah. that fun stuff. Um, so Janet asked if I have any advice for uh, folks uh, for bottom surgery, like post-op advice, and then also asked the difference between fallow and meta. Uh, so Kate and I are going to go over the difference between Fallow and Meta and I will quickly give some advice for um, post-op recovery for those who are considering bottom surgery. Meta, and simple Meta and a full Meta and Fallow are not the same. So if you're getting a simple Meta, not to downplay your experience or like all surgeries are serious, especially yeah. invasive surgeries where you go under anesthesia yeah it's serious business downtime from what i understand downtime with simple meta you know it is not the same um mm -hmm. and it's more similar to post-op like top surgery recovery mm -hmm. than the other two are uh so if you've had top surgery uh that should give you a reference to your body's tolerance to anesthesia and to being under that sort of physical trauma and recovery aspect, be on the painkillers, mm -hmm. all that. If you had a hysterectomy, uh, that might also be a similar experience because yeah. most people didn't have a hysterectomy like I did. Most people are down for like six weeks. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, uh, but if you're, uh, regardless of what bottom surgery you're getting, especially if, but especially if you're getting um, a full meta and full fallow, you have to have like ride or die support team. Uh -huh. um, you have to have like they have to be your people. They have to be like they. There has to be a zero percent chance of them like bailing on you yeah. at any point because they will be changing your bandages. If if you um, if you're shy about your body, you got to get the fuck over it. <laughs> my friend's uh, my friend who is my friend's wife. Um, she had to like change my my diaper like twice a day and like my my dick bandages, and so I had to. She's, she's completely like desensitized to it because she had to do it for him and like she mm. um, she takes care of injured animals and brings them back to health all the time. So mm. she sees blood and guts and poop and genitals all the time. Mm -hmm. uh, so it, it didn't face her. So I had to like get over that. I'm like, okay, if your body's shy, you're going to have a lot of people up on you in the hospital too. So you just got to, you just got to get over that. 
one of the worst experiences of bottom surgery, at least in the beginning, for like the beginning of recovery, was my first poop. Oh. Because I was so like blocked up from painkillers and from not having feeling in my lower body and like all that. Uh, I didn't poop for like, I think it was five days after surgery. Oh, no. <laughs> and like you can't sit down when you have fallow. I don't, uh, oh. I think it might be the same thing as, my, it might be the same thing. I don't, I don't know if it's the same thing as meta. Yeah. But with fallow, you have to like keep your dick at a 90 degree angle and then you have to be completely, you have to be lying flat at a time or you could stand for five minutes. Those are your only options for a month. So when you have to sh when you have to shit, you have to shit standing up. I definitely went longer than the five minutes because like I got I started prairie togging. Yeah. And it's like I couldn't get this. I was screaming. I scared the shit out of my ex. <laughs> she, I was telling her, "Don't come in here." Yeah. You need help him get the fuck away. <laughs> I scared some of the nurses. It's understandable. But, yeah. Yeah, and they gave me an enema. It didn't do shit. It didn't do anything. If you think that like laxatives and enemas will help you in that situation, they might not. So you might have to prepare for that. <laughs> that was painful. Um, yeah, if you like to move, fuck, I'm sorry. That's it's gonna be tough. Yeah. Just distract the shit out of yourself. I just watched like everything on Netflix and Hulu. Mm -hmm. I smoked a lot of weed. Mm -hmm. I had too much carbs and processed protein. Mm -hmm. um, I was also living with vegans, so I couldn't have meat. Mm -hmm. I love you guys. Uh, stability is a huge thing. Cause I had to move during my recovery, mm -hmm. uh, which is like stressful. But I had to move right before, and then I had to move during. So it was no. Oh, wow. Don't, don't invite stressors like that into your life. Uh, good luck. That's pretty yeah. much all I have to say at this point. It hurts with you. And honestly, when it comes to any surgery, it's gonna put stress on the body in different ways. And so, you know, like you said, I wish everyone luck to any people who are having future surgeries, because- Therapy. That, also that. Not just before, but during and after. Go don't, don't just- do it before so you can get your letters and then drop off once you get the surgeries. Follow up. Follow up. And with that amazing piece of advice, thank you so much for coming on today. If you want to see any more collabs that I've done, you can check that playlist out right here. I will link all of Jesse's things below. Have a great day and peace. Mm.